We're going to tell you about descriptive terms for structures of the body. And this refers to where things are located and helps understand how the body fits together in terms of when we go on to study further anatomy, we can understand the different layers of muscle. We can understand the different positions of bones. So we're going to give you some examples here. We've got a prompt sheet because we've got quite a few different ones here. So our first, first one is proximal. Now we could say that Chris's elbow is more proximal to his body than his wrist is. So it's near the body. That's the key, proximal. We could say that his wrist is more distal to his body than his elbow is. So it's further away. Superficial. We could say that Chris's rectus abdominis, his six pack, is more superficial than his transverse abdominis, which is deeper down. So we have different layers. So that's more near the surface, superficial. Whereas we could say his transverse abdominis is deeper than his rectus is. So it sits deeper nearer the core, nearer the spine. So we're looking at different layers there. Superior. We could say that Chris's head is superior to his body than his pelvis is. And we could say Chris, Chris's pelvis is more inferior in his, to his body than his head is. So superior simply means above and inferior means below. Anterior, you use this a lot already. So anterior refers to the front of anything. Now it could be relating to the aspect of a, a, a limb, it could just be a surface. So in this case, we're going to say that Chris's anterior is down his chest, whereas his posterior is behind him. Then we can look at, turn the face for me please, we could look at medial and lateral. So medial, well anything away from the midline becomes more lateral, and anything that is nearer the body becomes more medial. So if we look at an imaginary line from through Chris, through his nose, through his mouth, through his sternum, through his belly button, this would be the midline of the body. So we could say that Chris's um, arm is towards a lateral aspect of his body. If we look at muscles, when we look at the thigh, we could say that we have lateral head of um, vastus lateralis. If we look at the inside aspect, more medium, medial, we could say we have a vastus medialis. So we can use these terms to understand different positions in terms of muscles, but ultimately any surface. Then we have ipsilateral. Now ipsilateral means the same side. So if I look at Chris's arm and leg, this is ipsilateral. So if Chris was to move his arm and leg on the same side, so balance on one leg for me, and put your legs into a b duction, a b duction, and your arm as well. So this is ipsilateral arm and leg, the same side. However, when you move in the real world, you move in what's called contralateral. So Chris, just walk, take a stride and march forward for me. Do that again. <laughs> in the normal way, that's better. So what we have here is opposite arm to opposite leg and walk back again in the march. So when you move in normal motion, you always work moving contralateral, and we call it contralateral rotation. So opposite arm comes to leg. Hence, a lot of the movement patterns you'll see in our exercise is that we recruit that pattern in particularly things like balance training. So we might have you doing a, an exercise on one leg, and if we're doing one leg, we think about using the opposite arm, the contralateral arm to the leg you're standing on. This is why this has a better carryover to how you move in the real world. Okay, let's go on to the next part. What we'll now look at is, we're going to more descriptive terms for joint motions. So, what we have is classic ones that everyone knows about, but there's some deviations within these. So, Chris, I'd like you to go into elbow flexion for me. Excellent. I'd like you now to lower down. And if we get away from flexion, we're going into extension. So, extension is the opposite of flexion. Could you now go into hip flexion for me? So, we're flexing at the hip. And now I'm going to the opposite position, which is hip extension. So, into hip extension for me. Turn the face aside for us. So you can see Chris goes into hip flexion, and then hip extension. Excellent. And the same thing with bicep again. So we go into flexion, into extension. Excellent. Flexion generally is shortening or closing of the joint, whereas extension is opening. There are a couple of exceptions, but that's our general rule of thumb. If we look at the foot, we can break it down in a little bit more detail. Specific to the foot, we have dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Chris, could you show me? Plantar flexion, please. So Chris is going on to toes. So if you go on to tiptoes, 
the ankle is plantar flexing. Now, Chris, could you just go into lift the foot off the ground slightly? Good dorsiflexion. So now we have the opposite of plantar flexion. We have dorsiflexion where the toes are being drawn up towards the shin. So you'll see when we go into triple flexion movements, Chris, can you go into triple flexion, please? And you can do it standing up, that's okay, cool. So just stand up and go triple flexion on one leg for me. So Chris is going to triple flexion, which is referring to flexion of the hip, flexion of the knee, and flexion of the ankle. If we do the opposite, could you, Chris, can you do triple extension, please? Foot all the way behind, extend through the hip, so we have glute activation, knee or hamstrings, and ankle. So we now have triple extension, hip, knee, ankle. So generally we train people, we'll either be triple flexion, triple extension, or we'll be in neutral. Okay, let's look at adduction and abduction. Chris, could you show me abduction of the arm? Abduction. So abduction is taking away, or abduction. Lower down, and if we do the opposite, we're now doing adduction. Do the same thing in the, in the lower limb, hence people who sit down in the machines and use adduction and abduction units. So Chris, could you do abduction of the thigh? Great, and then bring the leg in. So now we're adding. So if we're adding towards the body, we're into adduction. If we're taking away, we're into abduction. Then we have external and internal rotation. Now this can also be referred to as medial and lateral. So Chris, if you could put your foot for me into external rotation. So he's pivoting in the hip, going into external rotation, or also known as lateral rotation, going towards that lateral line we mentioned earlier. Now could you go into internal rotation for me? So the opposite, we're coming towards the, me the medial line, so it can be called medial rotation or internal rotation. If you could bend your elbow for me and keep your arm at the side, we can do the same thing here. If you can go into external rotation of the humerus for me, so we're taking the arm out into external rotation, the opposite therefore would be bringing it in towards the body, towards the medial line, so medial rotation or internal rotation. Excellent, and lower down, thank you. Okay, let's have you turn and face the mirror force over here. And now we have protraction and retraction, very commonly used when we describe people's postures. So a lot of clients you'll find that you spend a lot of time sitting at desks, we refer to them commonly have a protracted posture through the shoulder girdle. So we have a lengthening through the back here. So we have a shortening through the front, so lengthening of the posterior aspect of the shoulder girdle and a shortening of the anterior aspect of the shoulder girdle. So this is our protracted position, closed. Could you now go into a retracted position, please? So retracted is now shortening the posterior aspect and lengthening through the anterior aspect. Hence, we use this a lot when we train our clients. You hear a lot of the coaching points given in the exercise section saying we're getting our client into a retracted position to lengthen out these tight pecs and to get better activation through these weak and often underused um, scapular retraction muscles, or adductors often called as well. Okay, you can relax there, Chris. Then we have depression. Chris, can you just turn and face the wall for me, please? Commonly used, mainly used in the shoulder girdle, we also have elevation. So Chris is going to elevate his shoulders for me. So you see the scapula are coming up, and the opposite of elevation is depression, so lower down. Now people hold a lot of stress in their shoulders. Again, sitting at computer terminals a lot, sitting in everyday life, we tend to find that we hold tension here and we often get drawn into this elevated position. So just as we use the postural coaching points and exercises of going away from retracted, coming into a more protracted position to open up here, we often give the same coaching point, come back up to the top. We often give that same coaching point to come away from elevation into depression. So we talk about depressing and retracting the scapula to help lengthen out pecs and get better activation, particularly through the rhomboids, but very much the lower trapezius and also other musculature in the serratus and around that shoulder girdle that gets very weak. You can relax, thank you. Okay, let's turn and face the front again. We're going to look at the foot now. We have inversion and eversion. So if we look at the foot, the foot can evert, which is coming, so the sole of the foot is coming into the, towards the middle on the body. And as we go the opposite way, it's called eversion. So we have inversion, so in towards the middle of the body, and eversion going away. Okay, excellent, put the foot down. Now we look at pronation and supination. So Chris, if you hold your hands up for me, easy way to remember this, how do you remember this, supination? Bowl of soup. So if the hands are up, we have supination, as if you had a bowl of soup in your hand. That would be supination. The opposite of supination, turned down, is pronation. Now we use the terms prone and supine very much in exercise. A lot of the stability ball exercises, we have people lying face down, we call those prone positions, and when they're face up, 
we call those supine positions. So you'll get used to using those words that we use very, very commonly in exercise descriptions, along with the planes of motion as well. Okay, we also have circumduction. Now, Chris, we're going to do circumduction of your shoulder to start with. Now, all the way around a big circle, imagine you're circumducting some, something. If you go around the globe, you, go, you circumduct the globe. Now, you're going to do circumduction in um, ball and socket joints. Bigger movement, even bigger. So we're going all the way around the joint's axis, that's the key. We can also do circumduction at the hip. So Chris can do that with standing on one leg. and show you circumduction of the hip. Okay. So those are our movement terminology. Remember, you're going to use those to describe exercises to help you interpret them. We're also going to be using planes of motion. And sometimes you might have the axis of motion put, put in together. The key point is, this is a, the language which we use in exercise and anatomy. It's going to help you well, help you communicate at the same level. That's the most important thing. So very important to understand these when you describe them, when we, when we discuss exercises and movement patterns. Thank you.